We've seen in our last couple of videos that electrolysis is a technique that we use to split compounds into their elements, which we do by passing an electric current through an electrolyte. For this process to work though, the ions in our electrolyte have to be free to move around. So for insoluble compounds, like most metal oxides, this means that we'd have to melt them to make them a molten liquid. However, for soluble compounds, like copper sulfate and sodium chloride, we can just dissolve them in water to make our electrolyte. So in today's video, we're going to see how the electrolysis of these aqueous solutions works. Whenever you do an electrolysis experiment, you're going to need a beaker full of electrolyte, your two electrodes, with the positive anode on the right and the negative cathode on the left, a wire joining the two electrodes, and a power supply in the middle. Now, the main difficulty with the electrolysis of aqueous solutions is figuring out which ions will go to each electrode. This is because in aqueous solutions, as well as the ions from the ionic compound, like copper and sulfate ions, there will also be hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions from the water itself because water in solutions splits up into its ions. To work out which of the ions will react with each electrode, you need to know a couple of basic rules. The cathode, which is negative, will attract the positive ions. So the metal ion from the compound, and the hydrogen ion from the water. But importantly, it will only discharge one of these ions, and we have to be able to tell which one it is. The rule is that the ion of the least reactive element will be discharged. So if we take a look at our reactivity series, we can see that if the ions of any of these metals were present, then the hydrogen ions would be discharged, because hydrogen is less reactive than these metals. Whereas if we had copper ions, then the copper ions would be the ones discharged, because copper is even less reactive than hydrogen. Over at the anode, which has a positive charge, we have a similar problem. As well as the negative ion from our compound, which could be something like a nitrate ion or a bromide ion, we'd also have hydroxide ions. This time though, the rule to decide which will be discharged is a bit easier. If a halide is present, so fluoride, chloride, bromide and so on, then they'll be the one that gets discharged. But if a halide isn't present, then it's always the hydroxide that gets discharged. To see how all of this works, let's see what would happen if our electrolyte was an aqueous solution of copper sulfate. The first step is to work out which ions we'd have in the solution. From the copper sulfate, we'd have copper 2 plus ions and SO4 2 minus ions. Then from the water, because remember it's an aqueous solution, we'd have H plus and OH minus ions. If we think about the negative cathode first, it could either discharge the hydrogen ions or the copper ions. So all we need to do is check our reactivity series, and because copper is lower down on the list, and so less reactive, the copper ions will be the ones that get discharged. So they'll gain two electrons from the cathode and form pure copper. And because all of this is done at normal temperatures, the copper will be solid, so it actually accumulates around the cathode. Meanwhile, for the positive anode, it could either discharge the hydroxide ions or the sulfate ions. So it would discharge the hydroxide, because our rule, remember, was that it will always do the hydroxide ions unless halides are present. So the hydroxide ions will give up their extra electron to the anode, and they actually go to form oxygen and water. The equation for this is that four OH ions go to form two H2O, one O2 molecule, and four electrons. Before we finish, let's try one more example where our electrolyte is aqueous sodium chloride. In this electrolyte, we'll have sodium ions, chloride ions, hydrogen ions, and hydroxide ions. So just like before, to find which of our positive ions the negative cathode will discharge, we look at our reactivity series, and can see that hydrogen is less reactive than sodium. 
so the hydrogen ions will be the ones that get discharged by gaining electrons and forming hydrogen gas. Meanwhile, at the anode, we have to pick between chloride and hydroxide ions. And because chloride is a halide, that will be the one that gets discharged. So it will lose electrons and form chlorine gas. If you haven't heard yet, you can find all of our videos on our website, cognito.org. You'll also find questions, flashcards, exam style questions, and past papers. And we track all of your progress so that you always know what to study next. So sign up for free by clicking here or browse our playlist here on YouTube.